Do you lock your doors at night, set your house alarm, make sure your windows are shut, your, your car's locked outside? Why is that? Why do you do that? I'm guessing it's because you don't want an intruder to come into your house. Last week, we talked about the importance of forgiveness. And, and this week, we're, we're going to talk about the, the power of unforgiveness, the danger of unforgiveness. And the truth is, very simply put, when we live in unforgiveness in our hearts, it's akin to leaving our doors unlocked at night. In fact, it's worse than that. It's actually leaving the door open. So if you wouldn't sleep at night with your doors unlocked, let alone open, why would we do the same thing with our souls? You see, unforgiveness is an open door to the soul. When we don't forgive, we keep the door open to the enemy of our souls. And he comes in and he wreaks all kinds of havoc in our life and in our relationships. Hebrews 12.15 puts it this way. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. See, forgiveness, as we talked about last week, is, is an act of grace towards someone. And so unforgiveness is a lack of grace. And when we live this way, it leads to bitterness and resentment. And ultimately, we end up being prisoners to our own pain. But when we forgive, we are not only freed from our own bitterness, but eventually we can lead others in their own forgiveness and restoration, in their wholeness. You see, transformed people can help other people experience their own transformation. We are in uh, the middle of a series called Becoming Whole, where we're looking at the idea of biblical transformation. And we've been spending a number of weeks in it. And this week, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. You can go ahead and go there in your Bibles. My name is Justin, one of the pastors here at One Hope. So glad you can join us this morning or wherever you're at. We are just so glad you're here. Or if you're listening to this at some time later, we hope that you are blessed by this message. And so we are continuing online, but uh, we're also excited to say that we are gathering in person again. And we are so excited about this. So I hope if you're watching, you're able to join us when you can. Uh, you'll be able to sign up uh, online to register for that. Uh, but we believe in, in, in gathered worship because we believe in the power of God's word preached. And we believe in the power of corporate worship. And so when we come together, something happens. We experience God together. And so I encourage you to, to come out and join us when you can. We're taking all the precautions we can, but it's also an opportunity to serve one another. You know, serving is a form of worship. And we've been in the habit of, of gathering online, and it may be hard to get back into the rhythms of serving, but I just want to encourage you that this is a great opportunity to come together and worship and serve one another, that we might experience the power of God together. I'm just reminded Galatians 6.10, let us do good to everyone as we have opportunity and especially to the household of God. And so I'd encourage you to, to sign up to serve, jump on a team uh, as we come back together so we can worship together. The other thing I just want to mention before we pray here is a prayer movement that we're starting on November 1st, just one week uh, from today called 150 Days of Prayer. And we're just going to be praying for uh, a home, for health, and for revival. And so you're going to hear more about that in the coming week. But we would love for you as a church to come together, sign up uh, for a day to pray. And uh, we would just love for you to join us as we ask God to do some big things and see what he's going to do here. So in light of that, let me go ahead and pray for our time today, and we'll jump into our scripture. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you have overcome the enemy. I thank you that we can take heart, that we can be encouraged. I pray now in our hearts, whoever's listening, wherever they're at, if there is unforgiveness, if there is unresolved anger, if there is bitterness or resentment in their hearts and in their souls, that Holy Spirit, you would come in and loosen that ground and you would allow them to move towards forgiveness and experience the grace of God and be able to extend that grace to others on their journey to wholeness. And so, God, we cannot do that without you. And so we ask you to 
be real and be alive in our lives and help us to be the kind of people you've called us to be. We love you, Lord. We pray all this in your name and by your spirit. Amen. Well, let's look at Ephesians 4. And whenever we look at uh, the Bible, we're going to be, again, in, in verse 26 and 27. It's good to step back and go, well, what's happening around this particular verse? And so we studied the book of Ephesians uh, a year or two ago. And uh, what we saw in, in, in the book of Ephesians was this. And this is common in all of Paul's letters. He begins his letters talking about what's called the indicative, what is true about you. And basically, he out lines what the gospel is in various ways. And then in the second half of those books, he begins to talk about in light of what's true, in light of the gospel, this is now how we live. And this is exactly what's happening in Ephesians chapter 4. In fact, if we back up just to verse 21, here's what he says. Assuming that you have heard about him, Jesus, and you were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. That's the sinful heart. That's what we've been talking about. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So a couple of weeks ago, we talked about everything that happened when we believed in Jesus, that we were given a new heart, that we were regenerated, that we were a new creation, that we were united to Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, justified. All these things happened when we believed in Jesus, and it gives us a new power to live by. And so this is what Paul is talking about as he moves on now here to verse 26, a very practical application of this truth. He says this, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now, you might ask, what does this have to do with forgiveness? Well, as we said last week, forgiveness really is connected to justice. And when we're wronged, when someone sins against us, there is an injustice. And we have the experience of being hurt. This is a wound. And what follows this wound, this feeling of hurt, is feelings of anger and sadness, and usually a mixture of both of those. And so what Paul is saying here is that anger is the exact appropriate reaction to sin and injustice. In fact, we are angry at sin because we bear God's image, and God is angry at sin. In fact, back in Genesis 6, if you remember, he's talking about how everyone's thoughts are evil all the time, and it says that God was grieved that he had made man. Furthermore, God's wrath is spoken of at length in the Bible. Why? Because God's anger is at sin. And so we too ought to be angry when someone we love or ourselves is sinned against. In fact, if you don't feel anger at sin, then you are behaving as less than human. Anger is the, the, the good and right response to sin. It's a righteous anger. Now, there is an unrighteous anger, and there is an anger that is self-centered and, and based on uh, unhelpful and ungodly ways. But when we think about sin, someone you love who's been hurt or wounded, or you think about your own story, anger is the right response. But what is crucial is what you do with your anger. Look at what Paul says. He says, be angry and do not sin. So we can be angry, but in our anger, let's not sin in our anger. And this is so often what we do. And the problem is, you and I are not God. And so when we try to right a wrong, because sin still dwells in us, we inevitably will not do it perfectly. And so sin will return more sin, which will return more sin, and you'll get into this back and forth retaliation, and, and it just won't end well. In fact, James 120 says, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And so ultimately, in our attempts to re at revenge and to avenge ourselves, we will never meet God's standards of justice. It's why we needed the cross, a perfect Savior, a perfect solution for sin. So then, well, what do we do with our anger? Be angry, but do not Sin. In fact, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Paul is emphatic here that we are called to process 
at our anger and to deal with our anger in healthy ways. In fact, it's so important that you shouldn't even go to bed if you're still angry. Now, Paul's not saying that you should never go to bed angry. He's emphasizing the fact that if we don't deal with our anger and our anger then grows into to bitterness and resentment, this unresolved anger will lead to all kinds of problems. And so this is Paul's point. And this is where forgiveness comes in, like we talked about last week. When you forgive someone, you're ultimately giving it over to God. You're releasing them from that debt, and you're giving it over to God. You're allowing God to be God. You release them from the debt, and you allow God to deal with it. Romans 12, 17, we talked about last week. We're called to not repay uh, evil for evil, to never avenge ourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is what forgiveness is actually doing. You're overcoming evil with good. And as we saw last week, we need to grieve the pain. We need to tell the truth about our story. We need to grieve it. And then we need to forgive, allowing Jesus to absorb all the sin on himself in the cross. Because the truth is, he died for all sin, the sin that we have done and the sin done against us. This is the greatness and the grandeur of the cross. And it's the only biblical way to deal with our anger and injustice. We ultimately trust in the justice of God on the last day. But don't hear what I'm not saying. This doesn't mean we don't hold people accountable. It doesn't mean we we don't seek justice. It doesn't mean we don't call the cops on someone. It doesn't mean there's not consequences. But at a spiritual level, to be able to forgive is to be able to release that anger and hand that anger and injustice into the hands of God and allow him to do what he will with it. We are ultimately trusting God with sin and injustice. And it's really important. Unresolved anger, as I said, leads to all kinds of problems. Now, you've probably experienced this at some point in your life, right? With your spouse, your significant other, a good friend, there's a rift that happens, somebody sinned against someone else, somebody hurt some, someone else, and then rather than dealing with it directly, we tend to go passive-aggressive on it, and we stew in our anger, and, and bitterness builds up, and we become resentful, And all of a sudden, you're not talking to each other anymore. You're not comfortable around each other. This is the power of unresolved anger. It's unfinished business. And ultimately, it's unforgiveness. It's living in unforgiveness, which in the end will defile many. But it's actually, it's much more costly than that. It's not just that it will destroy our relationships. Listen to what Paul says next here in verse 27. He says, be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your anger, and what? Give no opportunity to the devil. Give no opportunity to the devil. When we don't deal with our anger, it opens the door for the enemy to come in and do work. In fact, this word opportunity here literally means place, as in a place to stay, as in a room in your house, a place at your table. So when you live in unresolved anger and unforgiveness, you are literally inviting the enemy to come stay in your home and give you counsel and have a place at your table. In fact, this word can mean to have a position to, uh, to, to give orders and to have authority. And so this is really a serious deal. Unforgiveness and unresolved anger opens the door to the enemy of your soul. And here's what you need to know. You and I have a real enemy. Satan and demons are real. And their whole aim is your destruction, is my destruction. And Satan has schemes. He has designs. He's been doing this for a long time. In fact, Paul in 2 Corinthians 2, chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, he says this, talking about forgiveness. Anyone you forgive, I uh, do too, for it is, uh, it is for your benefit in the presence of Christ so that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Unforgiveness 
is, is one of the schemes of the enemy. Satan is a schemer, and he's been doing it since the beginning. And honestly, his tactics have not changed all that much. You see, Satan doesn't have to be creative to be effective. And he's very good at what he does. And so what is he after? Satan will do anything and everything to draw you away from God through distraction, disorder, desires, damage, emotions, abuse, neglect, complacently, complacency, sin, all of it. His whole aim is to convince you and to feed you the lie that God is not good, that God is not loving, and that God is not in control. He is not powerful, and he's been doing it from the beginning. We look back at Genesis 3, and here this Genesis 3 is not about, it's not just about what happened, it's about what happens every day. This is one of Satan's primary schemes to convince you that God is not good. Listen to what he says in Genesis 3.1. It says, now the serpent was more crafty, crafty because he has schemes, than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? He is calling into question God's word. Tell me this is not happening in your life every day. Tell me this is not happening in our culture, calling into question the veracity and the truth and the power of God's word. And he goes on in verse four. She answers him and he says back to her, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. This is Satan's scheme. God's lying to you. God's holding out on you. God's not good. Don't you know you have to take things into your own hands? You have to make your own decisions. You have to deal with it yourself. Genesis 3 is not about what happened. It is what is happening every day. And we have opened the door for the enemy to to come in and, and feed us these lies. It's been going on for a long time. The reality is Satan hates God and everything God stands for. And since Satan cannot directly hurt God, he goes after God's beloved creation and does everything he can to turn them away. And he keeps us in the bondage of unforgiveness. It's one of his schemes and we become prisoners to our own pain. So let me tell you how Satan works. He doesn't want me telling you this. Here's how Satan works. First thing he does is he tries to tempt us with sin by using God's good creation and God's good things and turning them for evil. You see, what Satan does is he takes what was meant for evil and he turns it for good. While what God does is he takes what was meant for evil and he turns it for good. Satan takes what was meant for good and turns it for evil. God comes and takes what was meant for evil and turns it for good. And what Satan does is he takes good things and he twists them and he, and he breaks them and he, and, he, and he causes them to be used in, in ungodly and shameful ways. I mean, one of the, one of the best examples of this is, is sex, right? I mean, sex is good. It was created by God. It's a wonderful experience. And Satan has come and just totally wrecked it. And, and pornography is, is rampant and, and, and many, many are addicted to pornography and cannot pull themselves out of it. And so Satan tempts us with sin. And then if he succeeds in getting us to sin, now he can really go to work. Now he can begin accusing us day and night about our sin. And he can condemn us because of our sin. In fact, Revelation 12, verse 10, says that Satan is the accuser of the brothers of our brothers and sisters. He accuses the children of God day and night. This is what Satan does. And so if he can get you to sin, now he can really lay it on you and tell you how awful, how unworthy you are, how unlovable you are, how you cannot be redeemed, how you're just lost. This is what he does. And then, and, 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 he's, and he's very effective at it. And on the other side of it, if you're the recipient of sin, if you're sinned against, he goes to work with accusation. And he tries to convince you that you're the reason that you were sinned against. 
that somehow it was your fault. And he starts laying on how unlovable you are and how unworthy you are and how no one would ever treat you with goodness or grace or love. I mean, this is tragic. And the, the abuse victims that I have counseled and, and dealt with, this is so often the case. At some deep, deep level, they have believed the lie that somehow this is their fault. It is satanic. He accuses the children of God day and night. He convinces us that we're unlovable, unworthy, that God is not good, that God is not to be trusted, that we have to take care of this ourselves. And this creates all kinds of pain and hurt in us. And now he can tempt us to go back to sinful solutions to cope with our pain rather than going to the good and loving Father we have, the only one that can heal us and redeem us. And so again, we run away from God and we go to sin and we get caught in these addictions. And because we sin, we feel further shame and and further hurt and further pain. We have to take things into our own hands. And one of the ways that we can begin to feel powerful is we hold on to our anger, our legitimate anger. We're angry, but then we hold on to it because anger gives us a sense of power and a sense of control. And so we hold on to it and we become bitter and we become resentful. We cling to it so that we can have some semblance of control. All the while, it's eating away at our souls. This is what unforgiveness leads to. And the enemy will just keep us there, stuck in this cycle of sin. And you could be there for years, for decades. This is how the enemy works. See, sin is the power of the devil, and he is particularly effective in our wounds. He will continue to shout in our pain that God is not good, that God cannot be trusted, that God is not powerful. How could he have let this happen? And we buy into the lie because of all the sin and all the suffering that God doesn't love us, that God isn't in control, that God must not care. And I'll tell you from my own story, it took me a long time to be able to trust God again. It was hard. The trust that God was good, that he was in control, that he is able to redeem anyone and anything. But slowly, over time, by degrees, my trust, my faith grew. And I began to see him as the one who can redeem the one who can turn evil for good and do miraculous things, raise the dead, do what you never thought possible. See, trust is not like a light switch. It's not on or off. It's more like a dimmer switch. It it grows over time. And so we take these tiny steps to trust God against the lies of the enemy. Because the truth is this, only the truth can shatter the lies of the enemy And the good news is this, the truth came in a person. The truth came in a person to show you that God does love you. See, some say that God is just passive and he hasn't done anything about suffering or evil, but that's wrong. He did do something, and ultimately he will do something. You see, he didn't just stay on the sidelines. He's not some passive God. He entered the game. He came in and he entered into our story, into the mess of our lives, And he didn't just suffer with us. He did do that, but he suffered for us. Why? To show us irrefutably that God loves us. God loves you. God loves me. The cross proves it. And this is the truth that we need to hear. He suffers for us. He takes our sin. He takes our pain and our shame, but not just ours, also those who have sinned against us. And this then begins to open the door to forgiveness. You know what 1 John 3, 8 says? I love this verse. Here's what he says. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. That's what we've just been talking about, this cycle of sin. You're, you're stuck in it. 
For the devil, he's been sinning from the beginning. But listen to this. The reason the Son of God, the reason Jesus appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The reason that Jesus appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. All the lies, all the deception, all the abuse, all the neglect, all the harm ever done. And he did it in the most unimaginable way. He did it in a way that you and I could not truly fathom. He proved his love at the cross, a historical, undeniable fact. Jesus died for you. The truth is that the truth of the cross, it shatters the lies that you are unlovable and unworthy, that somehow God doesn't care. God does care. He cares immensely. He cares enough to enter in and to rescue you at great cost to himself. This is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, God loved the world in this way that he sent his only son into the world, that those who believe may have eternal life and won't perish. God loves you. Your value and your worth was such that God entered in and died for you to show you that not even death, not even, not even suffering, nothing could separate you from the love of God. I love how Paul says it in Romans 8, 38 and 39. He says, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers, those, that's demons, that's Satan and demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are loved. Jesus' death proves it. He died to prove that God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love still stands. You see, God has not abandoned you. He promised that he would never leave or forsake you. God is with you, and he's longing for you. And when we believe this, we open the door of our soul to God and let him enter in, and we close the door to the enemy. And this is what we need. We need to open the door to God's love, God's goodness, God's power in our life, and we need to shut the door to the enemy and his lies. And when we're convinced of this, of God's love, you and I can also overcome evil with good through forgiveness. And then we can be healed. You see, we're freed by the truth. And when we shut that door, we learn to extinguish all the fiery darts of the enemies, all the lies. We hear them, we distinguish them. You see, we are, as Ephesians 6 says, we're in a war. And, and, he, and, and Ephesians 6 says to stand strong. So it's only after we've believed and received the love of God that we can stand strong. He says in verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against what? The schemes of the devil. For we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You see, human beings are not our problem. Ultimately, it's the satanic and demonic realm that we're battling against. And so here's what we need to see. Look at this image. We are in a spiritual war, and it is a war for our souls. Now, we fight this war. Do you know whose voice you're hearing? Because it's happening at a heart level, at a soul level. And one of the ways that we wage it is, as Paul says elsewhere, that we take every thought captive to the word of God. And so do you know whose voice you are listening to. Because if it's full of accusation and condemnation, that's not the voice of your Father in heaven. That's not the voice of Jesus. 
The voice of God is inviting. It's loving. It's joyful. It's calling you back home. It does convict you of sin, but there's a sweetness to conviction, and it's never a condemnation. And so we need to to know whose voice are we listening to. And this is one of the ways that we wage this war. And one of the ways that we can then begin to move towards forgiveness and be released from the power of unforgiveness. And so here is the question for us today. Is there unforgiveness in your hearts? Do you have any open doors to the enemy of your soul? Is he in there wreaking havoc right now? And ultimately this, will you forgive? Will you forgive? Will you move towards forgiveness? Are you willing to give your hurt and your anger to the one who suffered with you and for you to redeem you from sin, to heal you and provide a path to wholeness? Will you forgive? Will you overcome evil with good? Will you experience the freedom from pain that you have endured? Will you render the enemy ineffective? And finally, will you open the door to God's power and presence in your life and shut the door to the enemy of your soul and become whole and become healed and become his? Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you have not abandoned us but you pursue us and you are with us to the very end. And so I pray now for all those listening that they would be stirred by your Holy Spirit, that they would perceive the lies of the enemy, the ways they've been deceived, and they would take a small step of faith towards you as a good and loving father, as the one who wants to tend to their wounds and heal them and shower your love upon them. God, I pray for redemption. I pray for transformation in the hearts of your people. And may that transformation extend on out to every aspect of our life and every relationship we have. God, help us to forgive. We love you. Pray all this in your name, Jesus, and by your spirit. Amen.